So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Miller. I'm uh, on the board of Norman Williams Public Library. And on behalf of the board, I welcome you to our library. Uh, and um, this is one of many programs we have here during the year. So please uh, keep track of our website and see what's coming up next. Um, and I want to thank uh, the staff who set things up for us here. We've got uh, Meg and uh, Adrienne, who's downstairs. And uh, someone else help you? Two, so just two of you. <laughs> I, I don't know. There's Whoever said it. Group effort. Group effort. But uh, we appreciate the, all the work the staff does. Um, I'm also the uh, coordinator of the Learning Lab. And this is a program sponsored by the Learning Lab. In, in case you haven't heard of us, and I think still 80% of Woodstock area still has never heard of us. Um, we are an adult learning program, lifelong learning program. We have uh, courses most of the year except the summer. Um, this program um, is something we do occasionally to have a, a free public event. Uh, but if you are not on our mailing list and would like to learn more about what we're doing, uh, go to our website, uh, it's thelearninglabwoodstock.com, uh, or just come and see me after the program today. Um, but thank you for coming. It's a gorgeous spring day outside, so I'm, I'm amazed that anyone showed up. But um, it's going to be a great program. We had a, a great start last week uh, with uh, Ann Galloway from Vermont Digger. And then next week, uh, Phil Camp from our own Vermont Standard will be um, speaking. So please come back uh, again, even if it's nice weather again. Uh, so I'm going to bring up uh, John Matthews, who's on the board of the Learning Lab, um, who's going to introduce uh, our speaker today, Maggie. So, uh, John, it's all yours. And, uh, well, we're uh, really pleased to have uh, Maggie Cassidy here today. Uh, she's been the editor of the Valley News only since uh, last November. And she's a twofer, the first woman editor of, this news of the newspaper in 66 years. And at 30, although she may be 31 now after a few Just months, turned 31. <laughs> she's the, the youngest by far to have ever been the editor of the Valley News or at practically at any other newspaper in the country. Maggie literally grew up in the newspaper business. Her father was a columnist and the editor of the Met Metro West Daily News in Framingham, Mass. Maggie's first byline was as a high school sports reporter for her father's newspaper. She went to Northeastern University, where she interned at the Boston Globe. Later, she spent some time at the Molokai Dispatch in Hawaii, where it's hard to believe she ever left it to come here for <laughs> partially sunny days we usually have. Uh, then, then she worked at the Globe and the Boston Herald as a reporter and editor. Seven years ago, Maggie joined the Valley News as a reporter and later became, became its first web editor. Uh, she's done a lot of innovations trying to bring uh, the newspaper and the, and the staff into the, the web era. And I'm sure she'll t talk to us about some of that in detail. Like Ann Galloway, who was our speaker last week, described how, how she created a new news source on the internet, the Vermont Digger. Maggie will tell us how she's moving an old news source, a newspaper, into the digital age. So Maggie, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you all for uh, coming out on this beautiful day. Uh, it's nice to see you all, and I'm especially excited to uh, answer your questions um, after uh, I talk a little bit about um, what I see as the Valley News' goals and challenges um, in these turbulent times, uh, as the, uh, the name of this uh, program uh, suggests. Uh, when I mentioned to uh, a friend who is uh, mostly retired from the journalism business that I would be talking about journalism in turbulent times, uh, his reaction was, when have they not been turbulent? <laughs> um, and I, I have certainly felt that for the entirety of my short career. Um, as uh, John mentioned, I did largely grow up uh, scooting around the floor of a newspaper. 
uh, when my dad was an editor uh, at the Metro West Daily News, which was formerly the Middlesex News in uh, Framingham, Mass. They experienced some turbulent times trying to uh, adapt to um, the early days of the internet. This was especially in the 90s. I recall them trying to uh, rebrand themselves. That was the transition from the Middlesex News to the Metro West Daily News and thinking about um, what is their readership and um, how are they going to commute, uh, communicate their role to uh, to their readers, um, and frankly, they struggled with that very much. The Metro West Daily News today is a, a very small paper compared to what it was uh, in the 80s. Um, they, like the Valley News, closed their on-site press, uh, like the Boston Globe, like a number of other papers. Uh, their staff is very small compared to what it had been. Uh, so there's one example of turbulent times that, uh, that I was able to witness. Um, after that, I did go to uh, Northeastern and I interned at the Boston Globe during uh, their uh, buyouts and reorganization period. And I got my first uh, sort of full on journalism experience where I was essentially laid off from my journalism internship <laughs> because the uh, section of the newspaper that I was interning for was cut from the paper during reorganization. Uh, that was the City Weekly section, which is, was the equivalent of their regional sections, but for, uh, for the immediate Boston area. Um, and so that was tough because, um, one, I was uh, without an internship anymore, but two, it, it, it was a firsthand um, look at people who had much more to, uh, to lose than I did going through um, trying to weigh uh, their commitment to their profession and um, you know something that they found to be very important versus the realities of the industry and were they going to try to stick it out in journalism um, often after many decades um, or uh, take a turn and do something else. So that was a, another period of uh, turbulence. At the same time I was at Northeastern uh, working on the student newspaper. I was a reporter at the time. Uh, and the university was uh, displeased with some of the reporting that we were doing about the, the school at the time, and we're threatening prior review, which is to say uh, they wanted to be able to look at our articles before they were published um, because uh, they thought they should perhaps be a little softer. Um, and so uh, we moved the newspaper off campus and started a nonprofit in order to publish it. So at once giving up uh, campus funding for student groups and increasing our expenses with rent. And we timed it perfectly for the financial collapse uh, and, got, and got it all together right in time for uh, all of our advertisers to uh, stop advertising with us. Um, we had a really hard time uh, literally keeping on the lights. Um, we had to cut back on production and make really difficult decisions um, about um, just what the heck we were going to do and it, it, was, it was extremely trying. Uh, that newspaper uh, just this past year, so that was after 10 years, um, through fundraising and uh, other efforts got out of the debt that we essentially created for it um, when, we, when we tried to move it off campus. Still off campus, the nonprofit is still there. Um, but it just, it, it is an illustration, I think, of um, the difficulties of uh, making a go of it here at all levels. Um, and the last example I'll give you, so I did live in Molokai, on Molokai, a very, very small island in Hawaii. I was one of um, four people who worked at the Molokai Dispatch. We took out the trash, we delivered the newspapers, uh, we, uh, we did everything. Uh, I was technically an intern, although I was the only reporter, so uh, <laughs> however you want to see that. Um, and I was trying to decide whether to um, stick around in beautiful Molokai with uh, 80 degree weather and uh, beautiful white sand beaches. And uh, the owner of the paper 
uh, asked if we could kindly hold off on cashing our checks uh, for, for a couple more days or weeks. Uh, and that's how I ended up back in Vermont in January. Um, so it, uh, there has, I, I suppose this is all just to say that um, I have been doing this for a relatively short time, uh, but I have not seen a period of non-turbulence uh, in my career. Um, that said, I think, of course, the obvious difference between um, the turbulence that my dad felt um, any turbulence uh, in terms of uh, you know, <coughs> issues of prior review at uh, student newspapers and how those um, issues, um, you know, uh, similar issues, you know, off campuses, pushback from uh, sources, uh, difficulty um, getting information that uh, uh, is rightfully the public's. Etc. All of all of those um, forms of turbulence are not uh, new. What is, of course, new now is um, the ways in which turbulence are affecting newspapers who are no longer making it out to the other side. Um, so Anne Galloway, um, I was glad to be able to see Anne talk last week, and she uh, covered a lot of this ground. So I, I don't want to uh, rehash it. Um, too much, but um, the numbers are very stark in terms of uh, the closures of uh, papers across this country um, over the past 15 years. Um, something like 1,800 papers in the country have folded since 2004. Uh, a third of those are rural newspapers. Um, and I'm sure that we're all familiar with the term news deserts which uh, are uh, geographic areas or communities uh, that no longer have a dedicated news source um, and therefore are going without not only news but without uh, an organization dedicated to uh, uh, holding institutions accountable and being a watchdog for uh, um, various sources of power. Um, so I think that is the, the defining distinction between the good old regular turbulence and the, the turbulence that we face today. Um, and the question, of course, is how do we get through it? Um, which is a question that I'm not sure anybody has quite figured out the answer to um, as of yet, but everybody is working on. Um, and talked about uh, the next recession and um, uh, predictions about how many local newspapers are going to make it through the next recession. Uh, and the predictions are that very few will make it through the next recession. Um, that's something that I think about quite a bit. Um, and so the goal is <laughs> between now and then, whenever then may be, because it's going to happen, um, how can we set ourselves up to weather the next storm? Some of that is through what we're doing uh, in the newsroom, through journalism. Um, but a lot of it, frankly, is um, outside the scope of the newsroom and how we, as you know, a, a building and a company, uh, the specific newspaper and uh, our parent company, Newspapers of New England, how we're going to, uh, to set us up to weather that storm. So um, I will talk a little bit about my thoughts about all of that. Um, first, I wanted to do a little bit of numbers because folks seemed very interested in uh, digger numbers last week. So I thought I would talk about some Valley News numbers and how they've changed, which will also help to paint this picture for us. So the print circulation of the Valley News um, right now is something like 12,000 papers. Uh, we're currently uh, in the process of being audited. Um, for, uh, for comparison, that's about 6,000 fewer papers than in 1995 when uh, our, our peak circulation was uh, in the realm of 18 or 19,000. We have 1,000 digital-only subscribers, uh, a little more than 1,000. Um, that number increased by about uh, 350. Uh, over the course of 2018 to a total of a little more than a thousand. 
our digital trends. So uh, we've had no problem getting people to go to the website. The problem has been getting people to pay for it, and I'll get to that in a bit. But uh, in January 2015, uh, we had 800,000 page views. Uh, in January of this year, we had 1.7 million page views. Uh, neither of those are anomalies that, that showed that's a pretty uh, fair trajectory from uh, uh, essentially increasing an, by an average of um, our monthly average page views have increased by about a million in the course of uh, four years. Our users have also increased from uh, 180,000 to 200,000 to about a quarter million. Um, we're split down the middle, 50-50, men and women readers. Um, and uh, our uh, numbers in terms of uh, young readers are, I think, promising. So um, uh, more than a quarter, excuse me, almost half of our readers are uh, under the age of 44. That includes 7% who are ages 18 to 24 um, and a quarter who are uh, 25 to 34. Um, readers who are uh, 55 and older are about 20% of our readers online don't know about print. I don't have those breakdowns. And in terms of staff, the numbers in terms of staff, which also helps to illustrate uh, some of where we're at. When I joined the paper in January 2012, we had about 30 staff members. Uh, right now we have 21. So that's a, that's a huge decline, obviously. Um, and it's one that um, I don't think we really recognize in the newsroom or readers really recognize in the community until we tally it up. We don't feel it in the newsroom because all of those losses have come through attrition. So it's been a very slow, um, you know, somebody leaves and they don't get replaced and slowly things start to shrink and you don't feel it as much as if uh, there was a round of layoffs or um, if all of those, uh, those losses had hit at once. But obviously, that's a, that's a pretty stark departure from 30 to 21. That doesn't include, um, that's only full-time staff. That doesn't include, uh, you know, correspondents who work regular, regularly with us. Um, and it doesn't include part-time staff. Um, but it's an apples-to-apples -apples number. So um, in thinking about, um, how do we uh, get through the digital age? The two pieces that we're playing with, of course, are the print edition and the website. And how do we um, use both of those tools to, uh, to, um, to make it out the other end, essentially, and to serve our readers? Um, and so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how I view uh, both the print edition and the website and their roles in my mind. Um, in serving our readers, in keeping readers, and in getting new readers. Um, there's a lot of talk about what is the role of print these days. Is print going to stick around? Uh, print is expensive. Um, digital is the future, et cetera, et cetera. I still love print. Um, I think that print does a lot of things that uh, digital simply cannot. Um, and there is uh, something to be said for having a physical presence in a community um, that uh, digital just uh, cannot do. So to have copies of the Valley News lying around uh, your coffee shop, your library, uh, seeing people reading them. I love seeing people reading copies of the paper. Um, that's, that's, that's something that uh, I think folks forget about from time to time. Um, print is also our core audience. Um, they're our most loyal audience. They're our best paying readership. Uh, they're the most engaged. Um, the Valley News is best uh, consumed, which is to say you are going to get the most out of the Valley News if you read it every day and you read most of it. You don't have to read every single article. Um, but uh, in terms of context for our stories and context for issues, um, if you're going in and out one article at a time, um, you will get something from that experience. 
um, but it's not going to be the same experience as uh, we could only print uh, you know, a short brief on this issue today because we already covered it with a much longer story last week. Um, so if you only go online and see that short, short little uh, uh, brief, you're not going to get the same experience uh, as had you uh, been engaged the whole time. Um, there's also, there was a little bit of discussion last week about uh, reading broadly and reading deeply with print. Um, and I, I am uh, a believer that uh, you read differently in print. Um, there's, if anybody cares to look it up afterward, it is online. But uh, there is a um, researcher named Marianne Wolf um, who wrote a, a column for The Guardian about the different ways that our brain uh, absorbs information in print versus digital. Um, the concept of thereness, so to have something that you're holding and to be able to refer back to it and to think of it as a physical thing, your brain uh, processes that differently as compared to digital where things are flashing and scrolling and uh, for me I can get very distracted easily. Um, you, that's something that, uh, that uh, the print can do that, that digital I think uh, we're going to have to figure out, which is another thing that I will touch on briefly at the end. Um, print, in terms of um, world nation news, uh, news beyond the Upper Valley, um, that is something that I'm thinking about uh, on a daily basis. Um, because what print obviously cannot do, which our website can do, is uh, break news as it's happening. Um, and so my, my question that I weigh almost every day is um, big news happened on the world stage or nationally. Uh, how many of our readers already found out about it because they got an alert on their phone? How many of our readers did not? Um, and uh, how do we accommodate both of them? Um, one, of, one of the things that uh, I think that print can do um, in terms of that equation is uh, thinking about an analysis or um, you know a much broader look at an issue again the sort of deep reading long reading that you might not be as inclined to do online and that's something that I've been trying to do is instead of sort of the, the game story so to speak the blow by blow play by play look at a broader analysis of the issue for print um, with the assumption that some people have already found out about it online and uh, anybody who hasn't can still get the news through an analysis but can <coughs> sort of roll the ball forward. The role of our website um, is breaking news. That is uh, something that obviously we can't do in the print edition, something that a lot of our readers don't uh, realize the extent to which we are breaking news online, either um, sort of bona fide breaking news uh, reporting things that nobody else has reported, uncovering uh, news, etc., or um, uh, you know, being right there with everyone else in terms of um, uh, uh, news that has been widely distributed. So something comes in off of a press release, and we think that it's uh, valuable enough to be read. Now, we do a lot of that. We do, um, uh, you know, anywhere from one to two to sometimes as many as five stories a day online. Five would be really at the outside. Um, but that's a stark departure from even as recently as three years ago when we might do uh, a couple a week. Um, why do that? <laughs> because we think that there's value for readers um, and because um, well, I'll get to the paywall in a little bit, but because we're trying to bring in readers and uh, uh, think about what's most valuable to them, and that's something that they've shown is valuable. Mm -hmm. Role of our website, also experimentation. So um, we've done a lot of uh, projects on the website that have lived and died. Um, uh, some of them still continue on. Um, videos and breaking news are still kind of going to be the, uh, the core difference that we do online versus what we do in print. We also tried a microsite called UV Index, which was um, geared at 
uh, getting young, sort of digital-minded readers. Um, and I thought that it was very successful, but we no longer have the staff to support doing something like that. Um, social media, <laughs> which I see as a, a necessary evil. Um, so we have 12,000 print subscribers, as I mentioned. We have more than 17,000 Facebook followers. Uh, so there's something pretty wrong with that picture. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of problems with Facebook in general, just in terms of how they have uh, uh, sort of warped our understanding of news and uh, upended traditional news. Uh, I think about getting off of Facebook sometimes, but uh, the Valley News is not alone going to take down Facebook. And the reality is that a, a, a fifth of our online readers come in from Facebook. And if we're trying to grow our digital read readership, I'm not about to uh, get rid of all of those readers, at least not yet. Um, when you talk about maintaining the print edition, which for us is still um, the you know our golden goose egg, um, and decreasing staff as I talked about from, say, 30-ish to 21. The problem that you run up against is that there's essentially a fixed number of people that you need to put out the print edition every day in terms of um, layout and design and putting those pages together. Um, and that's really difficult work. So when you start to squeeze it, you're really running the risk of setting yourself up for more errors because those folks are our unsung heroes and the last line of defense for mistakes getting into the newspaper. Um, but as so long as you're putting out the same size print edition, so say 20 pages uh, day to day, um, that means that the only place to, uh, to look at decreasing staff is reporters and photographers. Um, and then that, of course, in turn uh, impacts the strength of your reporting overall. So, um, so that's another thing that I think about just in terms of uh, print versus digital. Print is always going to need that core layout staff. And um, are there ways to, uh, to rethink that? Or what is the role of the daily print edition? Does it need to be the same size every day? Um, in order to free up more reporting staff. So um, some broad challenges. I think I've probably mostly been talking about challenges at this point. Um, but very broadly, we have um, way more ways to report stories than we did seven years ago. We have video. We have podcasts. We do both of those. Um, we have interactive graphics. We do some of that. Uh, we have breaking news, which puts a real different kind of strain on the newsroom than one daily deadline uh, to essentially have a constant rolling deadline. Um, there are a lot of ways to, to do news these days, and we have a lot fewer people to do it. Um, so how do we balance um, what is worth us doing uh, versus what are we going to take a pass on? And that also trickles down to coverage decisions. What kind of stories are we going to spend time on? We used to uh, uh, put together a, a pretty detailed town meeting preview for uh, essentially all of our 46 towns. Um, and is that still the best way for us to preview town meeting coverage? Is 20 inches of copy per town? Um, my sense is no, that is not. Um, but that's, those are some of the decisions that we're up against. Um, another broad challenge, people don't really understand what we do in the way that perhaps they used to. Uh, every home used to have a newspaper and the Upper Valley used to be uh, smaller, less transient. Um, and we are now up against essentially everybody with an iPhone. Um, so, uh, and media literacy is also um, a real problem. Um, so that's another challenge, is just uh, a level of understanding with the public. And then there's the issue of paying for news. <laughs> um, so um, 
there's just, when papers uh, started dealing with the advent of the internet, there was this push to put everything online for free. And I think that people have gotten accustomed to that. Um, if you uh, try to bring that sort of back into the box, it's really hard. Um, but what I've been trying to do is to talk to people about paying for news, and it's been surprising to me how, um, how receptive people are to, uh, to, to thinking about issues like how is their news funded, what kind of resources does news take if you just start the conversation. So the goals are essentially the opposite of all of those challenges. Um, in terms of um, coverage decisions and um, how to decide what to do with uh, which new ways of storytelling are we going to pursue with a smaller staff. Uh, the Valley News has never had a mission statement, has never sort of, um, in my time at least, thought broadly about what do we want to be doing because the goal has always been pretty clear, which is to produce good journalism. Um, that's still broadly the mission, but uh, when we have fewer resources, uh, I think we need to define that better. So I'm working with uh, the staff right now who are very engaged in this process and also um, hearing from readers. Hopefully you might share some thoughts um, about what we want our role to be uh, over the next five years, the next ten years. Um, what is going to be our measuring stick for how do we decide which new um, kinds of storytelling methods are we going to pursue and which ones um, are not worth our time or effort? Um, and also, what kind of coverage decisions are we going to make? So um, when I say I don't think that we need to spend a, a report a 20-inch story on um, every uh, one of our 46 towns as a preview for a town meeting, that doesn't mean that I don't think that town meeting is important or deserves uh, preview coverage. But are there, are there other ways to do that more simply? Um, are, we've experimented with charts online, uh, with uh, um, uh, graphics and things of that nature, um, and trying to broaden out how we tell stories besides just uh, written text. Um, that goes for select board meetings, um, uh, just about anything that we do. Um, if the Lebanon City Council is um, having a meeting about streetlights, which we have grappled with, um, uh, do we go to that meeting and write a story about that one meeting, or do we go to that meeting and pull thread and say, how do we regionalize this issue and make it into something broader? Um, and tie our towns together in that way. So are other towns dealing with this issue? Um, how does it fit into bigger initiatives in Lebanon? Uh, things like that. It's still something that we're working on. Another broad goal, um, as I said, when you start to talk to folks about um, the challenges facing the news industry, um, the, the typical response that I get is that um, there's so much news about so many um, industries who are struggling that this isn't something that folks think, uh, spend um, as much time thinking about as I do, of course. And um, so when you start to get the wheels turning, people really do uh, um, want to talk about it, want to think about it. That goes for one-on-one -on -one interactions in person or in groups like this. And I've been surprised how easy it is to talk to people even on Facebook when folks uh, uh, complain about our paywall as one example. Um, when you uh, engage with them one-on-one, -on -one, they're actually surprisingly receptive to say, oh yeah, I do value what you're doing. That's why I want to read it so badly. Uh, it did take resources to put it together. Um, and so maybe I'll pay. <laughs> um, so engagement um, is, is another broad goal. Um, um, there's a lot to be said for online engagement. Um, that's something that the industry has talked about quite a bit, that uh, websites and um, the digital space is a place for reader engagement, but I'm also trying to translate that into uh, real world face-to-face um, -face engagement as well. Um, interested in um, 
a reader board, which is also an extension of um, of face-to-face -face engagement. So some other papers have done reader boards where they get folks together. Uh, they are committed to engaging with the paper over the course of the year and meet uh, once or twice a year to give feedback. Um, and uh, we're also working on putting together a reader survey as well as a non-reader survey <laughs> uh, to get feedback about what is working for people and what is not. So that goes, sort of circles back into the mission statement. More broadly than that, um, as I mentioned, I think the key is going to be um, bridging the gap over the course of the next recession. Um, so we've been looking, or I really have been looking, um, at uh, alternative modes of funding, journalism, nonprofits, trusts, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, what role can those play for the Valley News? There are a lot of things that we do uh, that make us feel an awful lot like a nonprofit. <laughs> Um, and um, is there a way to either partner with somebody or to um, build some sort of outside structure that could take on some of that work and then uh, uh, buttress the work of the newsroom? Uh, we've been applying for grants and things of that nature. Um, one of my great frustration with grants is that the conversation around local news is most often talking about something that is a world away from what we're doing. Um, it's talking about the Boston Globe, the Sacramento Bee, um, papers that uh, are much, much bigger than ours. The division for grants is generally um, papers in cities that are uh, smaller than the top 10 biggest cities in the United States, or papers with coverage areas of less than one million people. We've very much qualify for both of those uh, uh, um, numbers. And so that puts us competing for a very small number of grants uh, against papers like The Globe, and it makes it, it, makes it really hard. Um, I also wonder about, you know, Anne was talking last week about uh, the nonprofit news model. If we were to take every paper that has folded in the past 10 or 15 years and made them a nonprofit, we would uh, start to get back in the same uh, boat, which is there's um, just not enough money to go around. And so how would we deal with that? Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I've talked too long, but I'm interested in hearing your questions, is um, uh, we talked a little bit last week about um, um, print and digital and uh, reading uh, and print and reading digital, um, which I mentioned earlier with the, um, the there-ness of having a print edition. Um, I think one thing that newspapers really need to figure out to make it to, to this next, uh, uh, the sort of next iteration of digital news telling is, uh, is website design and layout and functionality, which is very small for a newspaper of our size to uh, figure that out on our own. We're uh, working with vendors to do that. But I've rarely, if ever, seen a, a, a newspaper website design that really works for me. Um, I think the closest is probably the New York Times, and they have a huge team of people who are constantly uh, modifying that, um, making it very specialized, um, et cetera. But for a, a newsroom of the Valley News's size, we really need a lot of automation built into our website because we don't have the staff to be, or the skill set to be modifying our website in that way. Um, and then there's also uh, a hardware issue I see. Um, so how people read digital news. We recently surpassed a monthly average of more than 50% of our digital readers are reading us on their phones as opposed to a laptop or a desktop. Um, and that's certainly not a place for deep, uh, engaged reading. Um, and then on the other hand, desktops are, are pretty big and clunky. Um, so you know, I think the nicest way to read the Valley News out of all the options, personally, is um, reading our e-edition on an on a iPad, like the one that I'm using right now. But uh, not everybody can have an iPad. And 
you know, what role does the Valley News have to play in terms of um, getting people to make that transition? I'm not sure. I just noticed that technology for for news is kind of being pushed in the opposite direction, uh, which is to say shorter bursts of news. Um, what I'm talking about specifically is Alexa. <laughs> when I went um, home to the Massachusetts suburbs for the holidays, um, everybody had an Alexa. Um, and Alexa just gives you kind of headlines about the news and um, uh, a very short version. Um, that's, and I think that uh, technology needs to be working to push people in the direction of slower reading and more engaged reading as opposed to this sort of surface level um, consumption. So that's an awful lot from me. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions with the panel. Our, our format here is to have a, a group of uh, uh, newsmen and newswoman and a newswoman <laughs> to <coughs> engage with the speaker, and then we'll have plenty of time for the audience to uh, all, also speak. So the uh, three of us will all get up here and introduce ourselves. Some other seats for Maggie. Yeah. Some other seats. Uh, yeah, I'm John Matthews, and I qualify in this uh, age of turb turbulent journalism because I worked for three newspapers, and two of them died. <laughs> and I, I went to NBC News, and that's still alive and more or less well. And I'm Bob Hager, I'm from Woodstock, and I worked 35 years for NBC News, so John was a colleague there. I'm Karen Gilmore. I worked uh, for three newspapers, and every single one of them survives, John. <laughs> but not in the form they were when I worked there. And then I went into television. And I worked for the Associated Press for a little while. Uh, Sandy Gilmore. I worked in local news for a number of years out of Salt Lake and in St. Louis, where I met uh, Karen. I worked for the Associated Press for a year or so, and then for uh, NBC News for uh, 20 years, with uh, three years at uh, CBS before coming back to NBC. So Bob Hager will start the questioning. Well, I just want to say first, I, I love your paper. I'm awfully glad it's here. I've been a subscriber to the uh, uh, Colonists are great, in my opinion, Kenyon and uh, Mackey and uh, John Gregg. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, when I was a kid here, uh, I was a freshman in high school when the Valley News started. <laughs> so anyway, uh, key thing, if, if the future is thought to be in the digital, um, does it pay for itself? I mean, can, can you make money on the web? I hope so. <laughs> That, I mean, I think that that is, um, I, I, I think that in order for us to get through uh, the next big challenge, um, we are going to need more people paying for digital than they are now. Um, and I do think that at some point we are going to have to find some way for digital to support itself. So whether that is through subscriptions um, I think that's going to have to be a, a big part of it. But whether, you know, as I said, there are, um, there's another way for, um, for people to support us beyond a subscription, I think that that's going to have to play a part too. Um, one thing that I didn't uh, talk about but that I, um, that I believe is that um, the way that we're set up right now, uh, being informed, uh, becomes a privilege because you have to pay for it, and I think that it should be a right. So I think that people should be able to um, access what we're doing um, at whatever level that they can pay for it. But first, we need to be sustainable before we start um, having those bigger conversations. Um, uh, and so, you know, is it something like tiered subscriptions where you um, pay more than a standard subscription for extra features. Um, 
that has been suggested uh, to me and that has been done throughout the industry. Um, I'm not sure what we can do with the resources that we have that could be an extra right now that would frankly be worth paying for. Um, uh, I do think that there are, is a population of readers in the Upper Valley who understands what we do and supports what we do and want to be able to support us through some other means. What about just at this moment? Does it pay for itself yet? Uh, no. <laughs> but you've got to be there, but it doesn't pay for itself. Right. So, um, we have a thousand digital only subscribers, so that's certainly not enough to support a newsroom even of 21 people. Um, all of our print subscribers are also digital subscribers uh, just by way of what they're, they're getting for what they pay for. Um, but I think that if we said today we're no longer producing a print edition, um, I think that would A, be a mistake, but I think that we would lose a lot of those subscribers and therefore it wouldn't pay for itself at all. I'll just add that in television, that was the deal, is the networks all knew that they had to be there on the web because everybody else was doing it. Uh, but I think to this day, they can't figure out how to make, it, make enough money on it. Right. Anyway. So, Maggie, if the Valley News, God forbid, were to go away tomorrow, what would be the effect on the Upper Valley? Um, I'm glad you asked because it's often something that I forget to talk about. Maybe it's because I don't want it to happen. <laughs> um, but I, th I think that that's one of the messages that we need to get out to readers uh, better is that whether or not you specifically <coughs> as an individual read the Valley News or not, um, the reporting that we are doing has an impact on the Upper Valley at large. Um, and so, you know, I think the Valley News does a number of things. Uh, I think by having um, uh, uh, our paper reporting um, on the towns that we do, I think that we're able to knit together the Upper Valley at large. Um, so uh, folks in uh, Royalton are uh, aware of what's happening in Newport, New Hampshire, and it kind of binds us all together. Um, as I said, I think that uh, one of the things that we have historically done well, and I think that um, we could continue to try to do is to regionalize issues. Um, so if we're not able to cover um, uh, the nitty gritty um, in the same way, um, can we give the broader overview of what's happening in this region? So that's one thing is sort of knitting together this region and defining it as a region. Um, and uh, two is um, holding uh, institutions uh, accountable or at least you know shedding light on what they're doing. So especially um, the biggies like uh, DHMC and Dartmouth College. Um, uh, without the Valley News, uh, you would be left to find out about what uh, those institutions or your select board or your police department are doing through their own Facebook pages, their own news releases, etc., um, which in my mind is a problem. Um, and um, three, I think that people uh, don't realize that even if uh, they don't read the Valley News directly. Uh, they don't care about holding uh, institutions accountable. They don't care about what's happening uh, six towns away, whatever. Um, there's a trickle-down effect of our news. So um, your neighbors, your friends, your family, your friends of friends read the Valley News. Um, and the conversation uh, originated with reporting that the Valley News did, whether or not uh, folks realize it. Can you move over here? There. I'm interested in the uh, comment you made about the Facebook, have, uh, Facebook having carriers, or how does it work? I, we don't do Facebook. We, yeah. we, we are online subscribers, by the way, to, to the Valley News, New York Times, and Washington Post. Hey, everybody but Facebook how does that work do you get do you have to subscribe to the Valley News to get Facebook to get feeds on Facebook and is it the whole paper or bits and pieces who, who chooses what and one of the reasons I'm interested is I noticed the New York Times two or three weeks ago 
and got a, I got an email saying, uh, we're following your preferences on what you're reading. And you might like this and you might like this. And it sounded like, you know, everything else on the internet. And I thought the New York Times mm -hmm. is doing this and they are. Mm -hmm. So another question is, can you or are you doing that online at the Valley News to follow people, mm -hmm. individuals and their preferences mm -hmm. through placement? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so, um, we essentially launched our Facebook, uh, I think it's been around for a while, but it was dormant and, uh, all of those 17,000, uh, people followed us within the past four or five years. And so essentially they have, uh, decided to, uh, to go to the Valley News Facebook page, click follow. And so whatever we post online is showing up in our, in their news feed. Um, Facebook does a lot of uh, finagling with their settings in terms of their algorithm for what people are going to see in their own news feeds. Um, so a lot of publishers um, put a lot of emphasis on posting to Facebook. Um, and then Facebook said, news is making people mad. Um, news is, is, you know, hard to read and uh, change the algorithm so that news shows up in people's news feeds less often and more often people are seeing uh, what their friends have posted. Um, so um, uh, I hope that answers the first part of your question. Um, we post virtually every story to Facebook at some point during the day. Um, the big benefit to um, readers, to Facebook users, I think is that they find out about what we've posted online. Um, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the easiest way to, to figure it out. I mean, you can go to our website and you can try to see which story have we posted that wasn't there at seven in the morning. But if you follow us on Facebook, you're going to be getting that in your feed, so long as you're actually on Facebook. Um, in terms, of, I didn't, I haven't seen that about what the Times is doing. So they're fall, they're trying to gear news toward individual readers. Currently, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, we we see you like this uh, Paul Krugman mm -hmm. columnist, and so many of you like to read this. Yeah. It's quite annoying. <laughs> I, I want to choose for myself. Right. I mean, um, I liked what Anne had to say last week um, uh, about the design of the uh, Vermont Digger website. Um, they used to be purely chronological. Um, it would just be very linear. Whatever was their newest story would show up at the top. Um, and then they rearranged it to be um, more like a front page of a newspaper. And you know what their editors considered to be the most important story would be bigger, and other things would be smaller. And somebody complained and said, uh, uh, "How dare you? You know, to try to decide what I'm going to read." And she said, "It's much worse than that. We're deciding what to report." Um, <laughs> and um, uh, in terms of um, Facebook, I think that that's one of the limitations of Facebook is that we lose that control. Um, we lose the ability to say, um, we think that this story is more important than this other story. Um, an example would be, you know, we, the process for what goes on A1 versus A2 versus uh, whatever is a very deliberate um, process with a lot of voices involved. Um, this person has been accused of a crime. Um, how big do we play their photo? What does the headline say? It's very deliberate. Um, Facebook takes all of those deliberations out of the equation and says every story has the same size photo. It's going to show up with no hierarchy. It's just in your timeline. Uh, and it's all going to be treated exactly the same. Um, and I think that that's a problem because um, the person accused of, you know, a crime that we think is, you know, worth reporting about and newsworthy and is in the public's interest to know about, uh, but on A2, um, uh, gets just blown up, you know, on Facebook. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's, that's just one of the considerations. Did you get any money from Facebook? 
The short answer is no. <laughs> I mean, it, the only way that that we get money from Facebook is um, the only way that you could make an argument that we're making money off of Facebook is um, the more readers we have, the higher we can charge for our digital ads, which are still very much pennies on the dollar compared to print. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty um, difficult argument to make that we're making any money off of Facebook. Um, and um, Facebook is more seen as uh, the, the concept of the, of the uh, reader funnel. So you start with uh, a very broad funnel. Way up at the top is, uh, you know, flyby readers on Facebook, um, people who are reading our, you know, whatever we're putting out there for free, which we do a fair amount of. Um, the next level would be getting those people to register. They're still not paying money, but they've registered, so they've made some sort of commitment to give us their email address and say they're going to have a password on our website and log in on a regular basis. Next step after that is to get them to uh, uh, do a digital subscription, maybe when we're doing one of our, um, uh, um, um, what am I trying to say? Promotions. Promotions, thank you. Uh, so they're not paying full rate, and then the next after that is trying to get them to pay full rate. And so Facebook is seen as a tool in that, in the very broad opening of the funnel to try to get, to just keep on bringing people down and down and down until ultimately they're a loyal subscriber, hopefully. Uh, the big problem, of course, that the Valley News has is you, you cover two states, and in Vermont you have Digger, which is getting a lot of a lot of use in, in your your paper for uh, legislative thing, le legislative issues and all. But in New Hampshire, you don't seem to get that much out of the uh, Concord newspaper, which is part of the same company. Is that a problem at all for you? Or? I, I think the, br the broader problem is um, uh, the state of AP in this area, um, the Associated Press Newswire, um, are faced with the same pressures and the same difficult decisions that um, its member newspapers, such as ourselves, are faced with. And so um, AP's coverage um, of the state houses um, has been in decline for a while. And so yes, that does force us to look out to Digger or to our sister paper, The Monitor, for um, their state house coverage. I think AP is a little bit stronger in New Hampshire anyway. Um, I think that uh, The Monitor, you know, Digger has like something like five reporters in the state house, I think Anne was saying, which is like, that's like, Wow, like that, you know, that's a big number. Um, so they're able to do like that, the the real nitty gritty. Whereas the monitor, you know, similar to us, is picking and choosing and making some editorial decisions about which thing are we going to cover. So I think that we still we agree with those decisions, and so we still um, if we find a lot of value in what they provide. We also partner with um, In Depth New Hampshire from time to time, which um, is. Uh, a similar, um, similar to Digger, except on a much, much smaller scale. Um, and, uh, uh, and then, yeah, there's still the AB. Your staff is 21, did you say that? Uh, correct, so yeah. in terms of full-time So staff. how many of those are reporters who devote their, most of their day to reporting? Sure, um, in terms of news reporters, um, it is about five people. Um, we have a cops and courts reporter, we have a business reporter, uh, we have a Lebanon reporter, um, and a healthcare reporter, um, and then we have one more person who's like a, who's not full-time staff, but who writes very, very regularly. Uh, and then we also have uh, Jim Kenyon who, um, uh, his columns are very reported, so I, I, I include him in, in that number. You're very good, by the way. Yeah, I agree. 
Um, and then we have um, one reporter who's like a features news split, uh, one more features reporter, and two sports reporters. And photographer? We have two full-time staff photographers, one uh, photo editor who often shoots. I think he's probably the last photo editor in northern New England. Um, and uh, we have had a full-time photo internship that has been um, very sought after from um, all corners of the country, but it's unlikely that we're gonna be able to maintain that uh, for the second half of this year, although we hope we might be able to bring it back. Um, I'm just curious, I think I probably should take the mic because I don't project as well as some people. Um, I'm just curious how many people read the Valley News and how many people read it online, if you, or both. Does anybody, okay, we're the only two who read it online, Peggy, okay, Charlie, okay, good. We read um, the standard, we read the standard too. So. Yeah, and, and online as well as print. But anyway, um, Maggie, I'm just wondering what you think the Valley News will look like in 10 years, and not what you want it to look like, but what you think it will look like. Um, so, um, I think the Valley News will have a much bigger digital presence than it does. Um, I think that um, uh, we will be posting more news online during the day than we are currently. And I think that our print edition will serve a very small, loyal readership um, who uh, uh, reads their news that way. So I'm, <laughs> I, w I would not venture to put a number. Um, but you know, I think for us to get there, um, we have to make the case more than, uh, you know, I think that um, we need to connect the dots for, for folks who aren't pr print readers now, you know, here's what print does, just decide whether that's something that you want to invest in, um, in order for it to, to still be here. I think that we need to be talking about it instead of uh, sort of hoping that people get on board or not. So um, I do, I'm not a print fatalist. Um, I, th I think that there's a role for print, and um, I, I, like I said, I think that there are a lot of things that print does that digital just can't, um, but I just don't think that that message is out there. I think all of the messaging is uh, print? Why print? That's antiquated. Um, and, you know, I could very well be naive, um, but I, I just think that when we start talking about these things, people start to get it, so hopefully. Well, I know we want to get to uh, questions, but I just had, had a quick one here. I've, I've heard about a neat, uh, seems to me a neat idea that some newspapers are doing to get reader involvement, in which you mentioned. And that is to put out, well, well some of them are just saying, uh, just stay in touch with us, uh, provide us your email, send us story ideas, things you're involved with, personal stuff, whatever interests you, and we'll, we'll aggregate that and see what other people are thinking. Another way is you put out a story saying we're doing we're, we want we want to hear from people who are having problems with their cars, uh, uh, tires going out, hitting you know chuck holes in wood stuff. So, uh, <laughs> are you thinking along those lines? Have you done some of that? Uh, is that a, is that a possibility of getting more viewers? I mean, more readers involved? Yeah, we've done um, a little bit of that. Um, we our healthcare reporter reporter um, Nora Doyleber has done some. Um, reporting on um, the state of nursing homes in this area. Um, and so one of the things that we did was um, to build um, a database where we could accept um, readers' stories and community members at large uh, stories about their experiences with nursing homes. And so they, you know, they could choose to say, um, uh, yes, you can use this story, or I'm just sharing this with you sort of for your own information. Um, but by filling out this online form, they populated this database with uh, names, phone numbers, contact information, personal anecdotes, 
um, numbers that became statistics, um, or the basis for statistics. Um, uh, you know, it, names of nursing homes, names of people who worked at nursing homes, et cetera, um, that became the, the basis for some of her reporting. Um, we've done it on a much smaller scale. Um, uh, I don't know that I can think of an example off the top of my head, but you know, how, how many people have experienced such and such? We did it with muddy roads. <coughs> Is your road really muddy and awful this year? Let us know. Um, <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, so we do, we do experiment with that, and I think that's um, where folks in the industry see, as I said, sort of the opportunity for engagement, so I think we need to be there too, but also translating that into um, 3D experiences as well. I think we will now go to the audience. Any questions, please? Uh, I was wondering if there's interaction between Valley News and different school newspapers uh, to encourage young people to go into journalism or just interaction and circulation. Yeah, um, there has been a little bit. Um, the Hanover High Broadside um, is a very active student newspaper in Hanover. Um, so they, uh, once a year, come to the Valley News and um, uh, tour the newspaper and talk to us. For a while I was uh, going up to, um, this was a couple years ago, but I was participating in a journalism class in Bethel at Whitcomb um, High School. Um, and uh, Kenyon also goes out and talks to various journalism classes at the high school level. Um, I actually meant, though, inviting students to, to have columns that they wrote and um, so parents would buy it. <laughs> I don't know if you have insider information. There is uh, some, there, we are working with um, a class um, to potentially do some of that. Um, it's, it is hard um, with uh, students. Um, we've tried it before, and I think we've seen what the challenges are and what we need to be aware of. Uh, we, we have a hard enough time getting, you know, I blow deadline all the time. Uh, students um, uh, have the same problem, but there's not as many repercussions, perhaps. Um, so anyway, I think, yes, there's probably opportunity for that, and I think we've learned some lessons along the way about how to do it better. Just a comment, really. Uh, I'm a news junkie. Um, I had online for four different newspapers and Google News, everything else along the way. As I was sitting here thinking, now if I didn't have any choices, suppose so, they finally caught up with me and threw me in jail and said you could have just one news source. That's all. Just one. Well, the Valley News would be head and hands down because number one, you get the local news. You get a field, you know, you know, national news and international news. So it's so important that the Valley News of this world continue. Thank you. Um, I think that also touches on um, something that um, the Valley News has historically valued, which is giving that whole picture, the not just the local, and, but also um, the you know New England and uh, the U.S. and beyond. Um, there's a lot of push to go more local, um, uh, and it's something that I've been weighing. So talking about like the analysis versus the sort of blow by blow news, and how much of that world nation goes out front versus how much of it is inside. So my thinking has been. Um, I still want the Valley News to be your one-stop shop for here's what's happening in the world today. I have been driving a little more local on the front and up high on the front with the hope that those most loyal subscribers will flip inside and still get those same stories or look down page and get those stories and that having a more local um, uh, top of the fold front um, might uh, entice other, you know, non-readers essentially, uh, people who aren't familiar with the Valley News to say, oh, I have been getting my 
you know, outside of the Upper Valley News in other ways, but look at what the Valley News brings. The Valley News does all of these stories that um, truly cannot be found anywhere else. So that has been part of my thinking, but trying to maintain that, that here's your whole world from, you know, your world to your country, to your region, to your community. But don't your photographs do that remarkably well? I mean, you have John Paul and James Patterson, and I can give you a whole bunch of, I don't know these people. <laughs> but, and, you know, those front, that front page with those photographs of the cow kicking the, the <laughs> it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I think your LA Times, uh, your articles, I, I, I'd be very sad to see anything happen to this paper. I think it really is important to this community. Yeah. Um, the the and trend John Greg. and John Gregg, yeah. John John Gregg, who um, as we speak probably is um, interviewing Bill Weld for an event that we're doing with yes. Digger, which is very unusual for us and new kind of thing we're trying. Um, the trend um, as newspapers faced these pressures, which um, hit other newspapers around the country more quickly than. They hit us um, in terms of uh, you know advertising revenues falling off and circulation uh, decreasing, which our our circulation has done very well, very very well compared to national trends. Um, but at, you know, as newspapers were faced with these budget problems, um, the sort of knee jerk response was, "Who can we cut? We can cut the photographers." Because how are we going to put a paper together without the writers and the the layout, which I talked about the layout folks, um, and I will never understand that because the di digital push, the, the digital world is so visual, and visual stories, photos are not you know just window dressing for the text. The photos are the stories as well. Um, whether it's a so-called standalone photo, so those photos that we run with no, you know, byline article attached, or whether it's a photo that accompanies a byline article, um, the photos are what helps the Valley News be the Valley News and be the 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 caliber paper that it is. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just never understand that whole cut cut all the photo staff, cut all the photo editors. And then there was a big push to video journalism for newspapers. They had just laid off their entire visual staffs and then decided they wanted to go visual. Um, and uh, I just, I, you know, hope that we're never in that position um, because of, you know, what I think visual journalism can do. So we need to go back there. Oh, uh, no, please go ahead. Uh, up here on our, our, our panel, most of them uh, subscribe to many newspapers. Uh, how about your leadership? Are they getting the national news from the Valley News? Or do they also subscribe to the Times and Washington Post? Um, that's a good question that I don't have a great answer for, and is one of the questions in our reader survey that we're trying to put together is where do you get your national news from? What news sources do you, um, I don't think we're necessarily asking what folks pay for, but what they consume. Um, because, you know, I do hear the criticism from time to time, you know, I get the post, so why, why, why do I get the, I'm just repeating my, those stories in the Valley News and that doesn't make sense for me, but I think that there's still a big enough readership who doesn't. Um, I'm curious to know what other national news sources are most read by our readers and our non-readers. Um, and I'm also very curious to know what folks would say when you ask them where they get their local news if the answer is not the Valley News. Um, so um, there are, of course, a number of other um, sources, but I, I just wonder what the breakdown is going to be. I'm very curious. One thing that's good about your national and international news is that the big out of town papers that we can get here in New York Times, Boston Globe, uh, the deadline is a lot earlier. So we get later national or international news out of the Valley News, thank goodness. Yeah. And once you look online, 
Yeah. Yeah, but no, <laughs> online would be, except for the Red Sox scores. <laughs> Right, so um, <laughs> so that yeah, so I mean I'll be honest, that's been very very difficult. Um, the um, so our our last page deadline, so the, the 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 time at which we needed to send our last page to the press uh, was previously midnight, and it was a little bit of a mushy midnight. You could say you could yell out back and say, hey, we've got something really big going on, or uh, this West Coast game hasn't quite wrapped up yet, but they're in the bottom of the ninth, and we really think we're going to get it. Can you just hold on? Uh, there's none of that anymore. And um, our deadlines uh, are 10. Um, so that's a, that's, a big, that's a big difference. Um, those two hours uh, mean a, a lot to us. And um, uh, the changes that we've gone through since February, any, any one of them, the new design, the new deadlines, the new way of communicating with the press, any one of those three things would be um, a massive undertaking, undertaking in and of itself, and we went ahead and did them all at the same time. Um, so it's, it's been, we're still figuring some of those things out. Where is the press located and how many folks work at the press? Um, it's located in Penacook, which is a village of Concord, New Hampshire. Um, and I actually don't know how many people work on the press. Um, that's a good question I should find out the answer to. Um, I think it's a couple dozen, um, include, you know, including people who are working on the actual press and then who are doing inserts, um, inserting ads and things like that. Um, Etc. So um, there's at the press. Um, for us, is now actually two presses. There's a red and a blue. We're printed on the red, um, and that includes us, the Concord Monitor, which is our sister paper, um, uh, and a number of our other um, uh, sister papers and products. And then the blue press uh, prints the Union Leader. Um, another a number of other commercial product, products. Maggie, uh, this is uh, sort of the elephant or the donkey in the room. What about the political stance of a newspaper? Are mm -hmm. you in favor of its being seen as neutral, or do you think it serves you well to be seen as favoring one or the other side of liberal or conservative? Uh, uh, I would say the former um, to be to be seen as generally neutral, particularly in our reporting. Um, our opinion pages, of course, are another uh, bag. Um, but I think one of the things that we can do a better job at, um, which I, I don't mean to repeat myself, but to be talking about what we're doing and explaining what we're doing, because I think that um, this sort of uh, um, understanding of how a newspaper works and the vocabulary of what goes into a newspaper, so an op-ed, an editorial, um, uh, an analysis versus a straight reported piece, et cetera, um, I think are not as clear to the um, average reader as they were I don't know when, many years ago, when people were regularly reading papers more. So talking about that distinction between the newsroom being um, unbiased and uh, uh, neutral, and then the opinion pages um, having a really strong point of view um, and trying to re represent a number of points of view um, is something that I think that we could do a better job at. Well, it seems to me that the Times, which is sort of the touchstone for many of us for the national newspaper, has for many years been thought of as a liberal newspaper with conservative writers. Uh, it doesn't seem to have hurt them, they, but that's their ability to have that profile. Do you think you could have a profile as either one, as either presenting the, the more the conservative point of view or more the liberal point of view? You don't think you'd survive? 
I don't know about the question of survival, but the question of you know what what service, how would that serve our readers, or how would that serve our reporting? Um, I think is the the first question, um, and I I you know I um, I'm of the mindset that everybody brings a little bit of bias to the table, but you ha it's in terms of um, understanding what your biases are and um, acknowledging them and. Uh, sort of leaning into them, then you're able to uh, understand what they are and make sure that they're not influencing your reporting. Um, I, I'm still, maybe it's old school, but I, I still am of the mindset that we should be presenting ourselves and trying to achieve, you know, as unbiased a newsroom reporting as possible. You know, if, if we knew the vision of the newspaper, like uh, we're telling the story of our community, and then the mission would be, how do we do that? I doubt in any of the sentences of that mission you would say, we need to be a print medium. Uh, because if we are telling the story, we can tell it in many different ways. Uh, I am someone old enough to love the tactile movement, kinesthetic movement of a paper, to feel it and to get black and things, because I grew up in New York City with the New York Times all over my face <laughs> you know, on a hot day. Uh, so there's nothing special about that, but the bottom line is digital. I get the New York Times for three and a half dollars a week on my cell phone and also, of course, on my computer. There's nothing richer than that because it, you can hook up to other articles and, and videos and things of that sort in a moment. Um, and so I, I think that it may be the time when we have to realize where's the, where's the break point over here. If we need to move to digital to survive, uh, once you're printing less copies, it doesn't, it, you, can't, you can't survive that way. And then you have to figure out what are you giving up. But if, you're, if your vision is to tell the story of the community, then that's it. That is what makes you go chills up and down your spine and down. So how do we best tell the story? Rather than we've gone out of business, we can't tell the story at all. I don't think it's about paper. I think it's about the story. And I think that if you believe in that, you will continue to do whatever you can to publish in quotes uh, the Valley News every single day. Uh, and I, I, I understand the idea of it would be nice to see people in country stores opening up the paper. I get it, but that's a Norman Rockwell piece of thing. Uh, bookstores are having the same problems. And uh, if, the, if the, the biggest issue is to tell the story, we have to find the story, we have to find a way of telling the story no matter what we're, we're doing. You know, just, just some thoughts there. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying and I, um, I agree to a certain extent. I think beyond telling the story, um, it's also uh, uh, developing more of a two-way street. So um, the idea of telling the story um, is, um, uh, you know, us at the Valley News coming up with what the story is and then putting it in one direction, you know, out to the readers. Um, and what uh, folks have talked about with digital, you know, as I've said, is that the whole idea of digital engagement and making it more of a two-way street. And I'm of the mindset that there, you know, so this 3D engagement that I'm talking about, I think can also extend to the newspaper because of, you know, what my thoughts are in terms of how people engage with print versus how they engage with the website. So, you know, I still, I still, think that you know print is um, the way to get sort of the um, the the slowest read, the broadest read, the deepest read. And so you know if as you say we are ultimately going to be all digital and you know my my predictions don't pan out, then that I think will be the thing that um, that newspapers such as and including the Valley News are going to be up against is um, if one day everything is all digital, how do we maintain the, that, that level of um, uh, loyalty and engagement with our readers? Because I, I do think that that's really hard online. Because you, you, can, you can go, you can you have videos, you can bop around, you can go to other news sites, and it's just not the same sort of uh, um, experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I come from... I was just going to say I come from the dinosaur era of um, newspapers and when I was a reporter at the Post-Dispatch in St. Louis, 
uh, we had old uh, royal typewriters, mm -hmm. and we had to change our own ribbons, <laughs> and, uh, a job that I totally hated. And one day, I was slamming my papers on the desk and trying to change the ribbon and swearing under my breath, and an editor came up to me and he said, this is the tool of your trade. Get used to it and learn it and stop what the, acting the way you are. So I did, and I learned it. And uh, I, but you know, we I'm not writing stories anymore, but I think we all do have jobs, um, and the job is to be an informed citizen. And it doesn't matter, I think, how you do that, whether you read it online or you know wherever you want to read it. Just read it. <laughs> You That's my it. feeling. So, I mean, print versus digital to me, I don't think print's going to go out of style either, but I don't see why it's a huge discussion, frankly, except people who just won't deal with the digital. Or people who just won't deal with the print. <laughs> yeah, so. or, which yeah. I've had both. Yeah. I remember, uh, I guess back in the 50s and 60s, my father always watching Walter Cronkite after supper and then reading the newspaper. That was the tradition of what happened. I think it happened in many houses. Uh, there was that set period. Uh, does that exist anymore? Are people setting aside, uh, setting aside some time to sit and read the newspaper? Or are they using the digital format, reading an article or a few articles when they're waiting for the dentist, or getting their car fixed, or, or whatever it is. I think um, we're shouting back at the cable channels at that time of day. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are a couple of things that come to mind. Um, uh, it's yeah. probably dangerous territory for me to tread into delivery. <laughs> um, but if uh, folks don't get their paper on time in the morning, we certainly hear about it, which suggests to me that uh, there is a time when people are looking to read their print edition to start their day. Um, and uh, the other thing I know is uh, similar to what um, Anne Galloway said about when people read Digger, it's the same time that they're reading the Valley News, which suggests to me that online people are uh, getting to work and instead of working, <laughs> instead of jumping right in, they are um, spending a little bit of time at their computer browsing around Digger, the Valley News, whatever other uh, sites are sort of in their digital, uh, you know, reader, what they're reading. So that's like 9 a.m. is when there's like a big bump in our readership. And then what you see throughout the day is that we get, you know, it sort of goes up and then it goes down over the course of the day and then there are little bumps as we post more news. Um, so I, th I think that by and large there people have a routine. Um, yeah. I think we had our hour. Barbara, 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 Barbara never got a chance. I only have to one originally, but I don't know if there's time for one. Yes, go ahead. One, one more um, and then that's it. Is there an ethos of the paper, sort of a mindset, an, an ideology about what kind of news you want to print or what percentage of different kinds of news you want to print? So world, international, I mean, international, local, national, um, sports, features, but um, good news, bad news, or is, is there sort of a thrust for kind of like crime and, you know, the bad stuff that's going on in all the towns, that's kind of the focus, and certainly it seems like that's the focus on page one, but um, is there sort of, do you guys talk in the, you know, the newsroom or whenever you guys meet about, you know, what percentage of the paper you want to have allotted to different sort of subjects or topics? Um, I'm not sure that we talk about it in that way. Um, I, th I think the the way that we talk about it is in terms of um, as newsworthy things happen or as we find out about things, how are we going to write about it? Um, so going back to the examples of um, uh, going to a select board meeting and writing a daily story or um, trying to broaden it out and write about it um, in a more regional way or from a a broader look. Um, uh, 
it might sound um, uh, not very specific, and I think that's because it probably is, but um, the, the, um, the mindset of the Valley News or sort of the way that we have always tried to judge things is simply on its merits. Um, and uh, that might not be a particularly satisfying answer because it is so vague. Um, but it actually helps to just say, um, is this something that we want to be writing about or not? In terms of the world nation balance, a lot of that has to do, frankly, with how many ads we're selling and what kinds of pages are open in the paper for us. You know, are we going to have a world nation page tomorrow or not? Um, if we don't have a dedicated world nation page, how much other space is there for world nation stories, stuff like that? Um, so all of those are constantly changing equations based on page configuration and all that kind of stuff. We want to thank Maggie for coming here. Thank you for all coming next week. Phil Camp, same place, same station. Hope to see you here. And thanks for the last one.